philosophers who state with confidence that miracles occur all around us every day. And that with a heightened awareness, we will be able to see these miracles and recognize the angels that walk among us. In 1879, Albert Einstein was born in Germany. At the age of 15, he moved with his family to Italy and gave up his German citizenship. Contrary to popular belief, Einstein struggled with school until he attended Aral, where there were physics facilities and excellent teachers. After Einstein was appointed to an associate professorship at the University of Zurich in 1908, he quickly became one of the most respected physicists of all time, contributing to scientific thinking with his theories of relativity, photoelectric effects, and quantum mechanics. Recognized as one of the preeminent geniuses of modern science, Einstein had this to say about the miraculous. You either see everything as a miracle or nothing as a miracle. Even as we speak, the Miracle Research team is studying reports of the miraculous through objective eyes and preparing them for your consideration. Children are innocent. They come into the world pure and full of light. Some would say a baby is perfect, untarnished by political upheaval, war, or crime, as nature intended, with a true beginner's mind. Is that why we have so many stories of angels appearing to children? Is it their innocence, their purity? Welcome to Could It Be a Miracle? I'm Michelle Wolford, segment producer. And I'm Bob Evans, producer. In this episode of our show, we'll focus on children and angels. Each of our segments involves an angelic visitation which occurred specifically to a child. There are countless examples of these occurrences. For our purposes, our segments include a boy in need of immediate medical attention who receives aid from an unexplained source. Two brothers looking for a pickup basketball game find trouble instead and are helped out of a dangerous situation by a familiar looking angel. A newly relocated family receives a housewarming present in the form of an apparition with a message. And an emergency situation takes a turn for the better with some unexpected assistance. Our first story from an earlier episode of our program comes from Michelle's interview with Kelsey Tyler. Like many of our experts, Kelsey Tyler began her writing career as a journalist. She's written three books on the subject of miracles and angels. This story comes from Heaven Hears Each Whisper. It involves a precocious young boy and a mother's worst nightmare. is that they believe more easily. Um, they're, they're precious and they're um, small and they're unprotected and so they need their angels a little bit more maybe than adults do in some instances. But also they're more apt to believe. If they see an angel, if a person appears to them and says, I'm your angel, don't worry, I'll be fine, they believe that. They don't look and think, no, you know, like an adult would think. So I think they tend to see them more often. I think they tend to um, be helped more often, and when they relate a story that happened to them, it's very simple for them. It's not necessarily extraordinary, it's just factual. An angel helped me. Come on, Randy, kick it to me. All right, I quit. I'm going to take a walk. Mom! I'm on the phone. Mommy, I'm going to Grandma's house. I'm going to take a walk. Hang on. Randy lunches in 10 minutes. 
she was on the phone and like a lot of moms do when they're on the phone, she sort of motioned for him to be quiet and okay, have a nice walk. Randy, Dustin, it's lunch time. Where's Randy? He left. He took a walk to grandma's. Their, their grandmother lived about three miles away and there were several busy streets to cross and uh, the mother knew that even if he said, there, he didn't know the way there. I mean, he might have known which way to start, but he wouldn't have known how to get all the way to the grandma's house. And besides that, the traffic was horrendous between the two houses. Pete, Pete. Pete, wake what? up, wake what? up. What it's it? Randy, I don't know where he is. Okay, okay, calm down. No, 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 I have searched everywhere. Call 911, I'll check with the neighbors. Yes, yes, I have lost my son. Uh, a police officer was dispatched and the grandmother was called and you know, the mom explained that the little boy Randy was walking toward her house and could be anywhere between the two houses. The police should find him soon. Oh, Pete, what are we gonna do? He's just a little boy. Angela, I'm here. Mom, I'm so glad you're here. Oh, everything's gonna be just fine. I just couldn't stand sitting around the house anymore. But if you're here, what if Randy comes to your house? It's all right, Millie's there. She said she'd call if there's any news. Oh, Mom, I've looked everywhere. Well, why don't we go look just one more time? I think it's a good idea. I'll wait here. We'll find him. We'll be all right. Please, God, keep my little boy safe. The mother drove frantically around the different streets that were nearby, and there were no, there was, there was no sign of the little boy. Where can he be? I don't know. Oh. Randy. Look, Mom, Mom, there he is. There he is. Oh, my son, my baby. Mommy was so worried. Where was he? How did you find him? He was about to run into traffic. We just came to help him. Thank you for keeping my little boy safe. Thank you so much for watching out for him. It seems he wanted to go to his grandmother's, and we were going to make certain he got there. Come on, Randy, let's get going. There are a lot of people worried about you. Those ladies were so nice. Yes, in fact, uh, why don't you buckle him in? I'm gonna go thank them again. I'll be right back. It's not a sign of them. How strange. Randy. You know your mom and I love you. That's why we ask you not to wander away from home. And you know the rule about not talking to strangers. Those ladies weren't strangers, Mommy. Well, yes, I know that they were very nice because they helped you. And they weren't bad strangers. But you must remember our rules. You must stay away from strangers. But they said they were sent from heaven, Mommy. They were sent from heaven? They said they were from heaven, Mommy. Daddy, how did they get here? So, um spoken again right from the mouth of the child. It was an angel who helped him. This really is a parent's worst fear, to have your child missing. You always hope that you can count on strangers to help a child in need. What most of us don't count on is that our guardian angels may be the strangers who actually provide the assistance. When we come back, another child discovers that some things aren't for playing with. And when he hurts himself, an angel is there to help. Stay tuned for more miracles. Uh, I think angels play soccer and baseball, and I don't think they have hands. I think their wings are their hands. And if the soccer ball touches their hands, uh, then the other team gets to kick it at the goal. When they play baseball, they have a metal bat, 
bat, and then they have a big star as the bases. Then they have the star as the ball. And then when it's a home run, like all the other stars, the glow, like it, like they're fans. And I think sometimes they have parties and they dance around. Welcome back. Our next story comes from Michelle's interview with Sophie Burnham. Sophie is well known as the author of the New York Times bestseller, A Book of Angels. She is a delightful lady and a compelling writer. I had a great time meeting her. How did she get involved in this subject? Sophie's always been intrigued by the subject of the mysterious. So as a writer, she decided to write a book on the subject. Our next story doesn't come from her letter file, however. It was told to her by a friend who, as a boy, experienced what he believes was an encounter with his guardian angel. There's a friend of mine, Jack Mormon, who is an investment banker, and I was telling him about my book. He said, oh, but you know, I remember when I was a little boy, I was eight years old. Whoa! Hold on, son. What do you think you're doing? Making a sandwich? Uh, not with this knife. It'll cut your finger. But, Dad... No buts. What are you messing around with a big old knife like this for? It'll slice your finger right off. Now, you, it's better you use a butter knife. I don't like butter. <laughs> you don't have to use it for butter. But it's a safer knife. Dull. Are you mad at me? No, but I don't like to see you do dangerous things behind my back. Are you disappointed at me? Never. But I don't want to see you hurt. So don't be messing around with uh, sharp knives or scissors or anything without asking permission first, OK? OK. Because if you did get hurt, your mama would get awful mad and disappointed. And I would be very, very sad. OK? okay. Can you help me open this cheese? <laughs> well, I guess there is a use for it after all. <laughs> there you go. These are the two sections of the roof. All we got to do is lock them together and we're ready to go. Look, Dad. Oh, that is very good. It's really coming along. What next? Well, I guess we got to cut a hole for the um, door. And then we got to nail it all together. We're going to need more nails. What for? I just bought some. I was practicing. Oh, boy. <laughs> hey, practice makes perfect, huh? Well, looks like I have to go and get some more nails. You want to come along? No, I'll stay here. And do what? Wait for you to come back. OK. But don't do anything. I'll be back before you know it, OK? OK. OK. I could get out the hole. Dad showed me how it's easy. Be so surprised. Hello, is your mother home? No, I'm here by myself. Oh, what happened? I didn't mean to do it. It was an accident. Oh, I know. Let's see what we can do. Let's sit over here. Okay, sit down right here. Who are you? I'm a nurse. Now, I'll we'll have to take off that bandage. Oh, it hurts. I know. It'll be all right. I'm here to make it better. Here, can you fix it? Of course I can. I'm a nurse. It's not that bad. You're a very lucky boy. I know. 
Well, who was she? A nurse. <laughs> Are you sure it wasn't a school nurse, Miss Kalen? No, I don't know who she was. I've never seen her before. Huh. <laughs> it was only years and years later, 30 years later, that he told me this story, remembering it. And only when my book came out did he remember to tell his mother on an Easter Sunday, what, 30 or 40 years later. Sophie tells me that Jack, the young boy in the story, is today an investment banker. He never told anyone about the incident until years later as an adult. He said it wasn't until he was much older that he began to think back on the encounter and question what really happened. Most people wouldn't expect to hear such a story from an investment banker. But as we've seen from our case file, it seems miracles can happen to anyone at any time. Coming up, a friendly neighborhood hangout becomes dangerous ground, requiring help from a surprising source. When we come back. Welcome back to Could It Be a Miracle? Our next story comes from a previous episode and from Bob's interview with Brad Steiger. That's right, Michelle. Brad Steiger has written an incredible amount of books, both as a solo author and with his wife, Sherry Hansen Steiger. When I recently met with them, Brad began talking about a couple of brothers whose quest for a neighborhood game provided the playing field for an angelic showdown. This story is from Angels Over Their Shoulders, which deals with the involvement of angelic beings, especially with children, focusing on children. This story, which has always been one of my favorites, deals with two young boys who like to go to the neighborhood court and play a little pickup basketball. And also, it gives them a chance to see their hero play. Their hero they call Big Al, who had been an outstanding athlete in high school. You better lose, little brother. Maybe bigger than me, Willie, but I've got help. And what help is that, Jackie? The Archangel of Basketball, he's on my side. You need all the help you can get, little brother. <laughs> Uh-oh, look who's back. You know those punks, Jackie. They're just trying to look tough. Why did they hang out there anyway? They're looking to shake younger kids down and take their money. Pretend you don't see them. They'll leave us alone. But is it the infamous Jefferson brothers? You ready to hoop it up? Yeah. job that uh, only gave him Monday nights off, but on that Monday night he really played. And our little heroes of this story, Roy Lee and his little brother Jackie, they never missed watching Big Al play. Well on this particular night, it's, it's a Thursday night, and it's a very cold night. And But little Jackie says, you know, I, st I still want to go to the court. I still want to go play. Come on, Willie. It's too cold out to play, Jackie. Well, you won't notice once we start playing, please. Okay, little brother, but be prepared to lose big <laughs> hair. Could it? <laughs> and they walk to the park, and they pass the statue of the angel that's always there. And every night when they see, when they go to play basketball or whatever, they, they kind of say, hi, angel, and look out for us, angel, and help us make a good shot. Tonight, they basically say, keep us warm, because they're, they're freezing. <laughs> They go to the court, sure enough, they are alone. Gordon. Hope your eye can basketball's on duty, Jack. Oh, wait, big brother. Today, 
No money, no nothing. We don't want any trouble. Don't want no trouble either. We just want the money. Let's go. We don't have any money. Hey, mama, boy, you want your mama to come help you? At about that time, a voice says, leave them alone. And they look around, and there is Big Al. Let's go, man. You punks, get out of here and leave these two alone. Did you hear me? This court's for athletes, not bums like you. Get lost. Now! Yeah. Yeah. Show them. Well, Roy Lee and Jackie want to turn around and just give Al a big hug and say thank you, and they turn around, they're all alone. Where did Big Al go? And then they thought, well, wait now, he's only gets off on Monday night. What could be there on Thursday night anyway? I don't know. But they think, well, maybe he got off work a little early, was just driving by, saw the thugs about to pounce on him, intervene, save their themselves from a big beating, so they're just grateful. So Monday night when he's off and he's playing, that's when they're going to come by and they're really going to thank him. Yo, what's up, Al? What's up? Jefferson's. What's the word? Yo, we really want to thank you for saving us Friday night. Yeah. You really showed those punks who's boss. What are you talking about? I had to work Friday night. You know today's my only day off. Mm -hmm. But you were there. You scalped those guys off when they jumped us. Look, guys, I haven't been around since last Monday, I swear. Now, do you want me to help you make this team or not? Yeah, come on. When they walk home that night and they pass the statue of the angel, they realize it wasn't Big Al. It was an angel that took the form of Big Al. And they asked their grandmother, a very religious person, when they got home, what about angels, Granny? And Grandma says, angels can take any form they want to perform their mission on Earth. So in this particular case, we had an angel that took the form of Big Al and chased those thugs away. It is interesting that what appears to be an angel showed up as a familiar face in this situation. As Brad and our other experts tell us, angels can take any form they wish to accomplish their mission. Perhaps it was easier on these two boys for the angel to appear as someone they both knew and looked up to. Coming up next, a little girl's nightly visitor causes lack of sleep but brings a surprise message. Stay tuned for more miracles, children, and angels. Welcome back to Could It Be a Miracle and our special show on children and angels. Michelle suggested that the following story from a previous episode be included in this show. Maybe it was because you had such a good visit with author Richard Sennett. I enjoyed talking with him. He is the author of the book, The Haunted Southland. He's a great storyteller as well. And this story is one with a personal touch. It actually happened to his mother when she was a little girl. I met with Richard at the Levis Adobe Historical Museum, where he told me stories from his book, The Haunted Southland. He shared with me one special story from his mother's childhood. I think supernatural is maybe the wrong term. The supernatural really isn't super at all, it's natural. It's very much a part of the normal world around us. Have you ever experienced anything on a personal level that you would describe as miraculous? At this point in time, I have not experienced what you would call a miracle, but I'm still waiting. My mother did tell a story which I'd have to say was pretty miraculous. Uh, she's gone now. But um, back in the 1930s, so she came from a very large family, they had rented an old farmhouse in Orange County, which at that time was very rural. It was just a little group of four or five houses out in the middle of nowhere. And she, of course, had one of the upstairs bedrooms, a very small one. And the first night that they moved in. So, skinny pig, right here. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, bedtime. This is starting to feel like home already, isn't it? Slowly, but surely. You know what, I think that's enough for tonight. It's getting late. 
I hear there's a picture show in town. Well, why don't we see how much we get done tomorrow? Now, why don't you go ahead and get ready for bed, okay? She was in bed and woke out of a sound sleep to see the spirit of a man standing at the very end of her bed. You know, we can't afford to waste any food. Your father looks very... I'll finish it later. I promise. It's just, I don't feel good right now. Honey, this move has been the hardest on you, hasn't it? It's not that, Mother. I like it here. Well, then what is it? Last night... Yeah? I saw someone in my room. Oh, honey. You were just dreaming. I wasn't dreaming, Mother. I was awake. I saw him, an old man smiling at me at the foot of my bed. Oh, I'm sorry. Hope I'm not interrupting anything. No, Father. It's okay. Okay? All right. Well, I'm off to work then. Bye, you. She, of course, told her, her parents about this. It was very frightening to her. And, um,. Well, they, they, of course, questioned her about it, and a lot of it they dismissed as a dream, sort of a new house and surroundings. But the same thing happened Sarah? the next night. New home, new rules? Since when did you stay up past midnight? I'm not sleepy. Oh, honey, why don't you crawl into bed? I'm going to turn off the light and you go to sleep. We have a lot to do tomorrow. Okay. Good night, Mother. He now began to be a little uh, more open to the idea of such things, and so he decided to sleep with her. I've tied this end of the string around my big toe, and you've got the other end under your pillow. So if your late night visitor shows up again tonight, you pull the string and wake me up. We'll settle this once and for all. Good night. Good night, Good night Father. He was doing manual labor, very exhaustive work, and uh, of course he was sound asleep. What do you want? You Hi, I'm Gladys, your next door neighbor. I just came over to say hello and welcome. And hello. <laughs> And welcome. Gladys, how nice of you. Thank you. And actually, my daughter and I plan to stop by and introduce ourselves after I finish the laundry. <laughs> and to ask you a rather strange question. Okay. Honey? Well, is there an old man who lives around here? He wears a suit and hat and smokes an old pipe and he has kind, gentle eyes. Oh my goodness. You just described my grandfather, right down to the old pipe. <laughs> he lived with me until he passed away two weeks ago. Tuberculosis. He had passed away of tuberculosis just weeks before they had moved in. And they later checked the uh, family out. There was a terrible disease back in the 1930s. They didn't have the antibiotics we have today. And they did check my mother out, and she did have it. In the earliest stages, they were able to treat it. And uh, she credits her life being saved by that information. But interestingly, there was kind of a side note. The next night, another apparition appeared, but it wasn't the man. My mother described it as a beautiful woman, all dressed in white with a large skirt, and she had long flowing hair and a star on her forehead. Rest easy, child. You'll be very sick, but you'll get better soon. My mother wasn't frightened or of anything. 
she knew that this was her guardian angel. And after a time, it vanished away. She knew everything would be all right, and it was. Did Richard Sennett's interest in the subjects he writes about begin after hearing this story from his mother? Richard has had an interest in the miraculous for as long as he can remember. Perhaps his mother's story fueled his curiosity. You know, Bob, it's interesting to see a story where the girl did not recognize the nightly visitor at all. This story contains one of the common elements of a guardian angel encounter. The little girl says she just knew that this ghost was in fact her guardian angel. Coming up next, a mother fights to save the life of her child as a mysterious man looks on. There's an old Irish saying that says children are fresh from heaven. And I like that because it sort of uh, denotes that they have not had a chance for the world to get in there and do a number on them. Uh, they're, they haven't been corrupted, they haven't learned fear, they haven't learned, oh, wait a second, that can't possibly be. And so I think if there are angels to see, children see them much more easily than, than we do. Welcome back. I don't even have to look at Michelle to know she's smiling already. Could it be because our next segment is a new story from Joan Wester Anderson? Yes, having another Joan story in this episode is wonderful. She told me this story of an angelic intervention that saved a life. There are children, though, who see angels as ordinary looking people, just as we do, uh, adults do. Um, I'm thinking of a little girl, in fact there were two little girls um, who were playing with their mom one day on the living room rug, the younger of the two who had been sick. And so the mom was so happy that she was feeling better, she was kind of rolling around and wrestling with them and tickling them. <laughs> Let's get your sister. <laughs> I'm gonna get you. Yes I am! <laughs> Cindy, honey, what's wrong? Cindy, she's not breathing. Oh God, she's not breathing. Oh God, come on. Oh, Cindy, help! Somebody help me! My daughter isn't breathing. There was no one home. Everyone had gone to work. She was the only one. And she, she just faced this thing that we all face, the most horrible thing there is, that you're gonna lose a child. And all of a sudden, she had this feeling of complete and utter calm came over her from head to toe. And her racing thoughts stopped, and she thought, wait, I know CPR, I know what to do. Honey, you're gonna be just fine. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> We're gonna take you to the hospital now so we make sure that this doesn't happen again. Get my car keys and my purse, honey. <laughs> the other who sat in the stern looked like a very small boy. She missed the ending. <laughs> we'll fill her in on it tomorrow. We had a pretty big day today, didn't we? I'm so glad you were there, sweetie. You were a big help to Mommy. Can we talk about what happened to Cindy today, Mom? Of course we can. Remember what the doctor said? Mm-hmm. Cindy has bron... Bronchitis, that's right. And until she's all better, she has to take it easy and rest. Any more questions? Who's that man? What man? The doctor? No, the nice man in the hallway who put his hand on your shoulder right before you were breathing into Cindy. He was beautiful. I wish he could have stayed here with us. <laughs> the mom told me later that 
it was at that moment that she suddenly realized the source of this marvelous calm. Little children sometimes don't have language to express it the way we would. She only knew that she wanted to see this man again. And I would imagine that that's the sort of feeling that one gets when one sees an angel, that it's not enough just to have a brief glimpse. You, know, you want more and more. It is so common in these stories for the angel to appear, provide the much needed assistance, then disappear just as quickly. Our experts say that is the usual method of operation. Frustrating as it is for our researchers and ourselves, it would have to be so much more frustrating to the people who experience the visitation. I know what you mean. The need to thank the visitor is so important to us, but as our experts explain, that's a human need, evidently not required by angels. Coming up, a story that gives me chills every time I think about it. When we come back. Angels are spirits. They don't look like anything. They have no physical reality attached to the spirit. So angels can look like anything. And angels have taken all sorts of forms. So people will sometimes see angels with wings, even though angels don't have wings, because that's what they expect. If an angel knows that you're not going to recognize it as an angel, unless it comes with all the trademark symbols of Hollywood and Renaissance art, it will put them on just so you know what you're dealing with. Welcome back. Our next segment comes from Bob's interview with author Karen Goldman. Karen is the author of Angel Encounters. Bob had the opportunity to visit with Karen recently in Arizona where she told him a frightening story. As a parent, it's a story that strikes close to home. Just imagine your children playing an innocent game and accidentally placing themselves in a life-threatening situation. There's a great story someone told me for Angel Encounters. It's never going to stop raining. I know. Then we're never going to get to go outside. I know. And then the rain will flood everything. I know. Cheer up, you two. It's not going to rain forever. I know. I'm making some brownies. Will that help? Why don't you two find something to do while they're in the oven? Like what? Oh, there's plenty to do. Just use your imagination. When it rained real hard once, my aunt's basement flooded. Really? I wonder if our basement floods. Let's look. OK, we'll need some flashlights, just in case the power goes out. I didn't. It just opened. I 
think we're gonna be in big trouble for this. I know. And you know what else? What? I think someone opened it for us. Who? I don't know. She ran up and told her mother, and her mother just looked at her and said, honey, your guardian angel opened the door for you. Fortunately, reports of similar stories that ended with tragic results have helped to spread the word. People now know to remove that kind of door from older refrigerators. Our experts all agree that children have special bonds with angels and that they can use the eyes of innocence to glimpse what we find more difficult to see the world of the miraculous. We hope all our stories in this special Children and Angels episode have made an impression on you. If they have made an impression, maybe you're weighing the merits of each story on the basis of facts as presented. Maybe you're dissecting the experts' opinions or evaluating the believability of the people you've just seen. Our research team will continue looking for stories of the miraculous. We invite you to join us again next time when we'll present more stories of ordinary people who have experienced the extraordinary. Then ask yourself the question we ask every week. Could it be a miracle? How many times have we dismissed the unexplainable event as kismet or destiny? The stories you have just witnessed involved everyday people people who through extraordinary circumstance were forced to ask themselves the very question that we examine every week. Could it be a miracle?